Hello, my little money badgers. I got some great questions that you guys gave me. This is my first ask me anything, and if it goes well, meaning if you guys like it and you want me to do more, then please email me and just let me know. So you've got all the questions in the email that I sent you, but I'm going to read them out loud. And I'm going to answer them both with, with my voice and with price charts. So the first question is, eventually countries that have been holding dollars, U.S. dollars in reserve, are going to need to switch and hold reserves in other currencies like the Chinese yuan. When those countries sell or dump some of their dollar reserves, what are the implications for the U.S. dollar? So on the screen here, I have a price chart of U.S. dollars. Um, I, I kept the word dump in here. That was an actual word that the... Um, one of your tribe members use. Money badgers don't use words like dump. Uh, they're very hypey. Um, I, I actually do not think countries are going to be, air quotes here, dumping U.S. dollars. And in fact, I believe there aren't even that enough U.S. dollars around the planet. Um, it sounds pretty weird after there was, what, $3 trillion of U.S. dollars printed. But I still don't think there's enough U.S. dollars on the planet. What I think is more interesting is not necessarily that countries will turn to the Chinese yuan. Sure, some will. China is going to force people, other countries, to buy their yuan and their bond through favorable trading. Right? When you trade with us, we want you to buy our fill-in-the-blank in yuan and not in dollars. And that makes sense. Why, why should uh, the Central Republic of Congo first have to get dollars and then take dollars to buy something from China. That seems really weird, and yet that's a lot of what goes on in the world. So I don't necessarily think people will dump the dollar, but I think as China continues to grow its presence on the planet, it will maybe require its trading partners to trade in the Chinese yuan. Um, what's interesting is I don't necessarily think the dollar will crash or the yuan will go higher, but I do think gold is going to be one of those investments that that plays a big part uh, as I zoom out here on this gold chart I'm just going to go out 10 years uh, you've heard me talk about once gold breaks kind of this 1385 ish that that's a sign that really the first bullish sign uh, of course you see some I at least see some resistance right here where the gold is at right now and this is in dollars but if you price gold in British pounds, it's at lifetime highs. If you price gold in Australian dollars, it's at lifetime highs. If you price gold in the euro, it's just now at a new lifetime high. So it's kind of happening, but not in the way you want, right? Other currencies are getting cheaper to, uh, to gold. I almost said to the gold, to gold. Uh, but when things get really scary out there, the two reserve currencies of the world, actually there's only one reserve currency, but the two fiat currencies of the world that do well are the Japanese yen and the U.S. dollar and gold. Isn't that interesting? Uh, so I don't think they'll be dumping of U.S. dollars. Okay, question number two. I'm approaching the end of my years to be able to save for retirement. What's the best strategy for an investor that is within five to seven years of retirement? So guys, with everything, I'm not giving individual advice. This is me talking to many people. Um, I go back to what I train people to do. And what I train people to do is to know which of the four main asset classes on the planet holds the strength, which one is trending up and to the right on an absolute basis, and also which one is trending up and to the, relative, up and to the right relative to the other three. Right, But that's just the beginning of the training. The training really is about learning to ask the questions, the questions that you really want to know. And whether you're five years from retirement, just starting retirement, or five years post-retirement, you still have to ask many of the same questions. Now, how much you allocate to one asset over another also comes down to the type of price volatility you can handle in your life. But what I notice is most people have never been trained to visually answer these questions. And it's really interesting because our brain's designed to operate visually, not necessarily uh, emotionally, but to see, to see what's going on. So I think when someone's approaching, whether it's retirement or the age of 50 or the age of 60, 
I think you still have to be trained and really get, right, really get what's going with the asset classes, right? Because if you think about this, you know, a money badger, they don't, they don't really care as much about their individual age as they do about what these four asset classes are doing, right? Money badgers, they are unattached, right? It, and if I said it in the most disgusting way, they don't care which of the four assets is doing best. They don't care if a significant amount of their money is in gold or cash or bonds or stocks, right? What a money badger does care about is that their money is stable and growing. And that happens through training and it can't happen through learning. Learning, we used to think knowledge was the answer and that's when information was expensive back in the 70s. But now that information is free, it's actually knowing and being trained, right? A wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Herbert Simon, it's one of my it's 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 one of my PSs this week. It's the quote I've been pondering, and I've been pondering it for a while. And let me say it again: a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And let me just say, money badgers, they got a good filter. You got to have a good noise filter. Okay. Question number three, do exchange traded funds like SPY or IVV, let me just throw one of those up here on the screen. I'll just throw up IVV. Do the exchange traded funds SPY and IVV automatically reinvest the dividends from the funds? And the answer is no, they don't guys. You have to click a button on your brokerage site um, and it's pretty amazing. Here's SPX. This is an index. And then here's SPX total return, which is the index with dividends reinvested. And let me just scroll out here. The blue line has the dividends reinvested. Now this is both, both the blue and the red are the S&P 500 index. The red line has no dividends reinvested and the blue line does. And you can see, now I'm going back to 2014, 2013, 2012, 2011, and right to the very bottom, there's 2009. As you can see, reinvesting your dividends, that's the blue line, gives you 100%, 100 percentage points more than if you didn't. So um, to answer your question, no, they don't automatically, but you want to go in and do that. Okay, question number four, what is the best way to own precious metals? This is a question that it can be a much stronger question. And one of the things I do in training people is for them to figure out the strongest question to ask, because it's not a fair question to ask in the sense like, I don't know, what do you think the best way to own a precious metal is? But in the spirit of being able to answer this, I'd say the easiest way. What money badgers love is powerfully simple ways to track, right? So most people get caught up in whether they buy gold or silver or gold coins or silver coins or numismatic coins or bullion or, or 2X or 3X or CEF or GDX or GDXJ or individual precious metal, metal mining gold or precious metal silver mining or platinum or palladium. Have I exhausted you yet? And I believe that's the wrong approach. The money badger don't care about the individual. What a money badger cares most about is if they get the asset class right, right? Because think about this. Let's say gold goes from, let's say it's at $1,500 right now, US dollars an ounce. And let's just say for fun, just for fun guys, it goes to $15,000 an ounce. Do you think it really matters? I mean, really matters that much whether you own gold or silver or the metal or the coin or a numismatic or a bullion or an individual stock or an ETF. Obviously, some are going to grow more than others, and I've done the deep research. But what's most important is the percentage you have allocated to that asset, right? 3% in GDXJ or just for sake of argument, 80% of your money in gold. 
I'm willing to bet the 80% of your money in gold is going to turn out much better for your future. So what's the best way to own precious metals? It's to get trained to know the pros and the cons and the price volatility that you're inviting into your life when you buy. And most investors buy the wrong way. They buy something that they can't handle owning through the corrections. And even if we are entered into and have entered into a secular bull market in gold, most investors will pick the wrong vehicle and they'll get kicked out and they won't be part of the major, major secular long term. Secular is Latin for long term because they didn't, they were not trained how to allocate for really what they can tolerate, which has nothing or very little to do with, say, their age. It has much more to do with um, what allows them to sleep at night. Okay, question number five, RC. What are your thoughts on this Jubilee people are predicting? Oh, guys, I think the Jubilee thing was dragged out by one of the pick of the month newsletter services. A Jubilee is a great restructuring of debt. I'm pretty sure it's not going to happen where first world company, co countries just walk away from their debt. It's very likely that's going to happen through a debasing of their own currency. All currencies will get cheaper over time, right? So right now, maybe the Chinese yuan is getting cheaper, but then it'll be the Japanese yen's turn, and then the euro's turn, and then the British pound's turn, and then the US dollar's turn, and they'll just keep devaluing against each other. But the thing that will do well over that time period is what they're all devaluing against, and that is other asset classes, which it may be gold, right, which is a commodity, or some people could consider it, right, a currency, or it would be getting devalued against stock. What's most important is the money badger doesn't really care. It, the money badger is unattached, right? You want to be unattached to where your money is stable and growing. But unfortunately, we're so attached to where it is based on, oh, I'm this age and it's supposed to be in this thing here. And I think that's a big mistake. Okay, question number six. And let me let me go back to, I'm going to go back to an, a different chart. I'm going to go back to TY. Actually, not. I have not been to this yet. But this, and let me just really zoom out on this. This, I think, is one of the craziest charts we got going today. This is what the 30-year U.S. bond is yielding today. And as you can see, it's at lifetime lows. I can even go out to 30 years. I believe I can go out to 30 years, and it's going to get even crazier. Guys, this number can go to zero. This number can go below zero. Now, here's the question, question number six. Looking at that 30-year-plus history of declining interest rates, the question is, why has that been happening? Is this a reflection of economic success in the Western world since the 70s pushing rates of savings and encouraging savings? Is it really a reflection of mass accumulation of wealth looking for yield and rent seeking? So let me set aside rent seeking because that's an economic term. But here's the thing. When countries get more stable, they get richer. Let's just take an individual. When someone has a lot of money, they're no longer focused on making it, and they're more focused on not losing it, right? If you have $100 million or a billion dollars, you're probably not rolling the dice. You're probably thinking, I just want to make sure I don't lose it. And so what happens is, now that's just one individual, but countries are made up of individuals, and as countries get richer, what happens is that wealth seeks more stable more predictable uh, outcomes. And certainly up to this point, and I'm not like saying up to this point, wink, wink, the, more, the most stable outcome has been bonds, right? You give your money to the US government and they've always given it back to you, plus the agreed upon yield when you bought. So I think the falling yields are really a reflection of Western economic success. Now, what happens when they hit zero? How much farther do they go below zero? We're looking at the yield of a 30-year U.S. bond. 
And man, it's pretty impressive. It's below 2%, which it has never been below in the history of the United States. So the bond market is definitely kind of throwing up in a fetal position on the ground. I think that has more to do with what's going on in Europe and Germany and their rates. Okay, question number seven. I get that if you buy a bond with a negative yield and keep it until it matures, you are absolutely positively guaranteed to lose money. Who would do that? Why would anyone do that anywhere, anytime? Well, it's simple, right? So we, we know that there's only four places on the planet to put your money, right? Stock, fixed income, commodity, and real estate. And each one of those we can split up and splinter and slice two more, right? Like fixed income can be bond and cash. Commodity could be broken up into energy, grains, softs, metals. So we know we can break them up. So here's what's going on. When people are worried about the future, they just want their money back. Now, up until very recently, they would have said, hey, I want you to give me something if I give you my money, right? Like say someone says to the U.S. government, actually, let's just say to the German government. Up until recently, someone would give the German government their money for 10 years, and the German government would say, great, we'll take your money, and because you're allowing us to use it, we're going to give you 3% a year. Well, that has switched now. Now when a German gives their money to the German government for 10 years, Germany says, well, we're going to charge you to hold your money for you. There's, you know, fees and expenses, and we're going to hold this money for 10 years. So we're just going to charge you a little bit to hold it each year. And that's what's going on right now. And people are saying, that's great. I'll, I'll pay you to hold my money. I just need to make sure I get it back. And that just tells you where people are today and how fearful they are, right? They, they aren't acting like money badgers. You know, money badgers don't care necessarily about the why. They may want to know, but what they care about most is finding the stability. Okay, question number eight. You can't ignore traditional warning signs like all forms of increased debt, inverted yield curves, unprofitable companies, IPOing, high PE ratios that are supposedly justified by ultra low interest rates, right? Vast amounts of sovereign negative bond rates and the slowing worldwide growth, right? Like you can't ignore these things, right? Right? And the answer is, of course, we don't, we're not ignoring them, right? But what we most want to do is get trained to understand how price affects our portfolio size, right? That's what the brain wants to know. The brain wants to get trained, right? Because the P-E ratio in the year 2000 for the S&P 500 hit 44, 44. I don't follow P-E ratio, but today it's probably 26. I'm just guessing. It's close to half that. So I don't know what the high number is. It could go higher. What's most important is to get trained to understand how to look at price. Training is what makes the difference in portfolio stability. So it's not that a money badger would ignore these things. It's that, okay, given the environment we're in, what is going on with these four asset classes? And then from there, you know, to understand how to position your money. Okay, question number nine. What's the current state of real estate? Well, you know, part of it depends on where you live in the world. Um, there's easy sites to find to see real estate price charts of all major cities and countries around the world. But just speaking about the U.S., U.S. is at new lifetime highs unadjusted for inflation for real estate. So real estate's going up and to the right, guys. And part of the reason is, I'll just put in TNX, part of the reason is because yields are so darn low. This is the yield on the 10-year treasury. Um, and I sent my subscribers an email from a... Um, a veteran mortgage broker giving crazy, crazy rates out to people. Uh, so I sent that alert to my subscribers, and it's amazing how cheap 
we can borrow money today. So the current state of real estate, I think is very strong. Again, we have four asset classes on this planet. Real estate is one of them. It's kind of the quiet one. Real estate really is a reflection of your local inflation rate. So real estate in Silicon Valley is appreciating at about five or 6% a year because that's what local inflation is. And in Ohio, maybe it's 1% a year, maybe in the Cleveland area. So um, the state of real estate is very healthy and very strong. Okay, one more question and then a bonus. Question number 10, I believe a lot of noise is going around about the, about the trade wars, but I don't think it really has that much influence on the markets, what you say. So I want to pull up a price chart. Let me just go back. Trade wars are about 18 months old. They started on January 22nd. <clears throat> I'm kind of losing my voice. SPX, let's just do SPX. <clears throat> so they started here on January 22nd, at least SPX, this is not including dividends. The S&P 500, not including dividends, is up 1.6%. If we do include dividends, I'll do the same thing. The S&P is up 5%. So trade war started here. I, I do think the market is noticing them, but as you look at this price chart, you just got to be like, all right, well, we know about them. And here's the lifetime high of the U.S. stock market. And this is us. And trade war started here. So I think the U.S. is actually doing pretty good. Now, how China is doing, if we pull up a price chart of China, here's that same January 22nd price right here where my crosshairs are. And if you see where their index is, it's down, let's just round it to 18%. So they're down 18% since the trade wars. Now, they may not be the worst hit. If I just pull up VEU, and I'm going to do VEU without dividends reinvested. VEU is all world. So the world in general is down about the same as China. And then if I just look at... Europe to see if Europe's been hurt more. Let me get to the 22nd here. Europe is down 19.3%. So Europe's actually hurt more than China. Since the trade war started, China's down, I'm rounding now 18, what was it, 17, 18%. Europe's down 19, a little over 19%. And the US, we're up 5%. So this wasn't the question, but trade wars are definitely hurting Europe more than China. And the trade wars, air quotes, have not hurt the U.S. stock market. And guys, businesses are smarter than governments. So businesses will figure out tariffs. Now, I don't think we should have them. I think the trade war is a mistake. I do think what Trump should be focusing on is the intellectual property theft that China has been undergoing for 30 years and also the forced technology transfer that a lot of Chinese companies are forcing foreign companies to transfer to them. Those two practices absolutely, absolutely need to stop immediately. And we should be very hard with very little wiggle room demanding that China stop stealing. Not when I say ours, I don't just mean the U.S.'s, the world's intellectual property. They've been stealing it for 30 years. It's time they come up with their own ideas. And it's time they stop forcing companies that want to do business with them to transfer their technology knowledge to them. I am very much against that. Okay, last question, guys. Then I'm going to hit the pause button. Okay, question 11. From your viewpoint, is it really different this time? So here's what I love about this question. Uh, because the answer is yes and no. We will have a recession. All recessions are... Um, all economic expansions are followed by recessions. No big prediction there, guys. We are just about to enter the 123rd month of the U.S.'s economic expansion. Guys, that's in starting. The old one was 120 months, also known as 10 years. So we are in the 11th year of this economic expansion. There are no rules on this planet that says economic expansion can't go 12 years or 13 years or 14 years or 20 years or 22 years. I'm saying that more as a thought experiment, just so you know that there's no upper limit. Okay. 
This isn't physics. And even physics, there's theoretical physics and applied physics. So you have two different fields. Theoretical physicists, they can come up with the crazy ideas and the different ideas. And the applied physicists can be like, hmm, let's see if that's actually true. Unfortunately for investing, we don't have applied investment theorists and um, theoretical, which is too bad. I, I guess maybe I'm more of a theoretical, like, hey, what if this is true? What if that's true? But is it different this time? It's it's not different in the sense that we will have a recession. It's not different this time that when we do have a recession, the stock market will act in a way that scares the most people, right? So I don't know what that correction will look like. Will it look like a 60% correction in six months? Will it look like a 40% correction over three years? Will it be a 30% correction in 30 days? So I don't know what the actual correction will be in both depth and length. All right, that's the I don't know. And that's the is it really different this time? The answer is no. But it won't be what it looked like last time. It will be different. All right, everyone's looking at inverted yields. I do not think that's what we should be looking at. We should take a huge step back and go, I don't know. Maybe it's going to be gold telling us what's happening this time. Maybe it will be Deutsche Bank imploding. To keep your brain open, right? And be like, I don't know what it's going to be this time. It's going to be something. It's going to be something. But let's get trained so we can look at the major asset classes, right? Because they give the best signal. And it's not enough to just know what to do. Like the, the quote I'm pondering and I want you to ponder this week, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. Everybody thinks knowledge is the answer. That's, last, that's the last war. That's the war of the 70s and the 80s when knowledge was power. Today, training is power, right? Seeing what works is power. Thanks, guys. I know this AMA was a little bit longer, but I think it's fun. And again, if you like these AMAs or you want to ask your question, please go ahead and just email me at rc at fearless wealth and just put AMA in the subject line. And I will do this again if you like this, guys. Thank you so much for being in my world. And again, this is RC Peck, and I'll speak to you soon. Take care.